All right, so if you'll open to Mark 15, we're going to be in verses 1 through 5 this morning. And so we're really coming uh, close to the end of Mark. And as we do so, uh, we find ourselves at the very precipice of, of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Uh, as I said last week, um, we're actually going to be on the resurrection uh, right on Easter Sunday. And so that's going to work out perfectly. Uh, of course, these two events, the crucifixion and resurrection, uh, these stand at the very center of our Christian faith. And this really is one of the major factors that makes Christianity so unique among world religions. For these two pillars, uh, the crucifixion and resurrection, uh, they're not mere concepts, uh, nor are they private revelations, but these are actual events rooted in history. And again, that's one of the things that makes Christianity unique, is uh, that it really hinges upon these actual events in history. We'll talk more about the resurrection soon enough, uh, but first comes the crucifixion. And uh, we'll see a key figure in the crucifixion of Jesus is Pontius Pilate. Uh, we see this even in the very first verse of our passage this morning. Uh, chapter 15, verse 1, it says, As soon as it was, as, as it was morning, the chief priest held a council with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And so you remember before this, that Jesus is kind of being tried before the Jewish authorities. And so now they're taking Jesus to uh, the Roman authorities, right? Because uh, they kind of, the, the Jews kind of operated to some degree on their own, and they governed themselves in some sense. But ultimately, uh, at this time, uh, the Roman government was in authority. Uh, they certainly could not put someone to death uh, apart from the Roman government. And so now they take Jesus to Pilate. Uh, we might say that Pilate is, is somewhat of a historical anchor for the crucifixion of uh, Jesus. Uh, Pilate, of course, was uh, a ruler over that particular region. And, um, and again, he, he really is kind of like a historical anchor, right? As, as we think about um, this pillar of the faith actually being rooted in history, well, Pilate kind of gives us some, some reference there. And uh, we see, for example, Pilate um, even mentioned in uh, the Apostles' Creed, right? Uh, I believe in God the Father, the Almighty, maker, uh, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. And then likewise, even in non-Christian sources, for example, uh, the Jewish historian Josephus, he writes, Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had Jesus condemned to the cross. And so again, he serves there as a uh, somewhat of a historical anchor. And now this condemnation of Jesus to the cross, we'll, we'll see this come to uh, fruition in our uh, passage next week. But before Pilate condemns Jesus, he questions him. And the question that Mark highlights in our passage that will, will really be the focus this morning is this question. He asks, are you the king of the Jews? Right, that's the question that Pilate, among others, but the one that's highlighted here is this question. Are you the king of the Jews? Now, Jesus certainly didn't look like it, right? Standing there, um, in chains before Pilate. And yet, the answer is made clear to us, if, if, if even in an ironic way. Because you see here, the one who is appointed to judge both the living and the dead on the great and awesome day of the Lord, he stands silent before his earthly judge, saying nothing more than the words, you have said so. Right? So Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? And his response is simply, you have said so. And Pilate stands amazed. If you'll stand with me in honor of reading God's word, we're going to read Mark 15, verses 1 through 5. As soon as it was morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? 
And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer. And so Pilate was amazed. Let's pray. God, as we consider Jesus as the King of the Jews this morning, but also consider uh, the irony of this scene where Jesus bowed before Pilate, very timid it seems, simply answers, you have said so. As we consider these things, Lord, I pray that you will help us uh, to maybe understand the gospel in a greater way. Uh, I pray that you would even give us applications for our lives, uh, that you would just speak to us through your word, by your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so, so two points this morning. First is that Jesus is king of the Jews, very simple. And then the second is Jesus is both a lion and a lamb. And so first, Jesus is king of the Jews, right? That's, that's the question. Are you the king of the Jews? And as I've said, it's made clear that he is. Um, but let's just talk for a moment about what this means. Of course, we must not think for a moment that Jesus' kingship was limited or is limited to the Jews, right? So when we say that Jesus was and is the king of the Jews, it's not that he is only king over the Jews. Um, the reason why he's called king of the Jews is because he came in fulfillment of the Jewish prophecies, right? And he ministered within the context uh, of the covenant that God made with the Jewish people. But Jesus clearly is Lord over all. And I think uh, Scripture's testimony to that is clear. But it began with the Jewish people. I mean, it goes all the way back to Abraham. Remember, Abraham was uh, the, the father of the Jewish nation. But do you remember the promise that was given to Abraham? The promise was that all the nations of the earth shall be blessed through you. So understand, this isn't just for the Jews, right? This, this was so that all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And Jesus came for that purpose. He died for that purpose. And he reigns as king over all. The meaning here of king of the Jews is closely connected to the, the meaning of Messiah or Christ. And does anybody remember the, the literal meaning of this word Messiah or, or Christ? You can, you can shout it out if you remember. Say your good guess. No. Uh, anointed one. Anointed one. Okay? So that's the literal meaning of the word Messiah or the word Christ. Christ is just the, the, the Greek word for is Christos. is the Greek word for Messiah. Okay? And it literally means anointed one. And so this is important because what I'm saying here is that there's actually a connection between uh, this title Christ and King of the Jews. Because think about it. Um, when, uh, I always go back to David. I, we see this with all the kings of Israel. But uh, David in particular, uh, you know, you remember the story when, when Samuel goes to find this king uh, among the sons of, of uh, Jonathan, right? Huh? Jesse. Yeah, Jesse. I knew it was, yeah, the sons of Jesse. And, uh, and then finally, whenever uh, he comes to David, he says, okay, this is the one. And what does he do? He anoints him with oil, right? And that's what was, that was, what was done for all the kings of Israel. They were anointed. And so this, you know, this anointing, being anointed and being a king, there, there's a um, connection between the two. And so that's relevant for, um, uh, for this broader context in Mark because do you remember the question that was asked of Jesus by the high priest just in, in the previous chapter, right? Whenever Jesus is, is on trial before the Jewish authorities, the question is, are you the Christ? And so understand, uh, these, these are very much the same kind of, very much the same question. Are you the Christ? Are you the king of the Jews? Now when Jesus is asked, uh, by the high priest, are you the Christ? His answer is quite bold. Uh, he responds, uh, quoting from Daniel 7, he says, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power, of power, coming with the clouds of heaven. A bold answer he gives there in chapter 14. Um, in chapter 15, we'll see this next week, we actually see that the terms... Christ and king are paired together. Like if you just skip down, you see that in verse 32. Um, 
They're mocking Jesus. It says, let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Actually, that's, that'll be a few weeks from now. But anyway, we, uh, again, we see this connection between Christ and King. And uh, it leaves no question in our mind that if Jesus is Christ, Jesus is King. Right? Again, we see that bold answer to this question. And even today, right, when Jesus says, you have said so, it's clear he is claiming to be king. But understand, if Jesus is Christ, he is king. We cannot separate the two. And um, as I was thinking about this, I thought, you know, it's kind of like today. Uh, a lot of people maybe kind of try to separate, for example, Jesus being uh, Savior and Lord. Right? Um, some people might say, oh, well, Jesus is my Savior, and yet they don't really bow the knee to him as Lord, whether they acknowledge that outright or not. But there are some who actually say, yeah, you can have Jesus as your Savior, but not as your Lord. You can't separate the two. Just, just as you can't separate Christ and King, you can't separate Savior and Lord, right? It all fits together. Even as we move to the next point, we see that Jesus is the Lion and the Lamb, right? You can't have one or the other. You've got, you've got to have it all. So, again, Pilate's question to Jesus is, are you the king of the Jews? And the answer is clearly yes. But here, he's not so bold as he was in his response to the high priest. Right? Jesus' answer is, you have said so. Throughout the next few paragraphs, we will see Jesus called King of the Jews no less than four times. Right? It comes up again and again and again and again. And yet, it's all with a tone of mockery. Just look with me as, as we kind of make our way through chapter 15. So we see it in this question, but then look at verse 8. It says, And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate. Um, oops, I already, I, right off the bat, I wrote down the wrong number. There we go, verse 9. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? All right, so, so I think there's a mocking tone there, right? Pilate didn't actually think of Jesus as a king. Now, Pilate was a little bit sympathetic, it seems. Um, but uh, make, no, make no mistake, he, he did not think highly of the Jewish people. Uh, number 12, verse 12, Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with this man that you call the king of the Jews? We especially see the, the, the mocking in verses 17 and 18. It says they clothed him. So, so now they, he's, been, um, he's been condemned. And uh, it says they've clothed him in a purple cloak, twisted together a crown of thorns, and put it on him. Let me pause right there. Kids, I remember it took a long time for this to click with me as a kid. Yeah, I mean, you all know, like Jesus, how when he was crucified, he had a crown of thorns. And I just always thought, okay, well, that's just a kind of a mean thing to do. And it was a mean thing to do. But do you understand, they were making fun of him. They were mocking him, saying, oh, you know, he claims to be the king of the Jews. And so here's your crown. And they put this crown of thorns on his head. And then, uh, did, I, did I finish reading that out? Verses 17 and, and 18. It says, it says that they began to salute him. Hail, king of the Jews. And then verse 26, the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews, right? Over the cross, they had an inscription. And actually, I love in John, uh, we, we see more detail in John because in John, the, uh, the Jewish authorities, they wanted him to write, he said he was king of the Jews. <laughs> and so when they see it, they're like, oh, no, 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 no. It was supposed to say, this man said he was king of the Jews, but it actually just says king of the Jews. And, and then uh, Pilate says, I've written what I've written. Um, so there's some irony there, isn't, isn't there? And then in all of these, in all of these um, uh, instances of this phrase, king of the Jews, throughout, throughout chapter 15, there's this irony because there, there's a tone of mockery in it. And yet, with every one of these mockeries, we should hear the echo of Jesus' words. You have said so. Right? Hail, King of the Jews, they say, as, as, they're, as they're mocking him and beating him. You have said so. And, and so, so we, we hear this um, echo of Jesus' response to Pilate. And so while we see before the high priest, 
right? In, in, the, in the pre-trial, we might say, uh, Jesus models for us the boldness to speak the truth in the face of opposition, right? When he, when he uh, responds so boldly to the high priest. But then here, before Pilate, we might say that he models for us a confidence to stand silent before an accuser. And so there's a time and place for both of those. Number two, Jesus is both a lion and a lamb. So, of course, it is Jesus' status as king that makes him a lion, uh, as he is called the, the lion of, of Judah. But, as I said, there's an irony throughout this whole trial and crucifixion because he doesn't look like one, right? He's asked, are you the king of the Jews? And he's mocked for being called the king of the Jews. I mean, he's, he's in chains and he's beaten brutally. He doesn't look like a king, But instead, like Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. All right, that was written centuries before. And here we see it fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus didn't need to prove himself before the likes of Pilate. As I said before, you know, there's even an irony as, as he stands before this earthly judge because Jesus is the one who will judge the living and the dead in the great and awesome day of the Lord. He didn't need to prove himself to Pilate. And, and of course, the truth would be plain soon enough. I mean, it's kind of... I mean, just with his resurrection, right, that makes it plain. And then we know that even still he will come again in great power and glory. And so he didn't, he didn't need to prove himself. Instead, for my sake and for your sake, Jesus chose to shoulder these accusations, many of which were false. Of course, the accusation of the king of the Jews, yeah, that was true. But look at verse 3. Look at verse 3. It says, and the chief priest accused him of many things. Well, we don't see exactly what those things are here, but uh, like Luke, for example, uh, gives us some more detail. Luke tells us that one of these accusations was that Jesus forbade them to give tribute to Caesar. Absolutely not true. Right? In fact, right, remember Jesus is asked about paying taxes. He says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Right? Uh, that's absolutely not true. Or uh, earlier we saw... Um, again, in his pre-trial, we might call it, with, with the uh, Jewish authorities, how they twisted um, his teaching and, and said that Jesus said that he would destroy the temple. Um, you know, it, it was a twisting on, on another teaching of Jesus, um, but uh, certainly he did not claim that he was going to destroy, uh, that he himself was going to physically destroy the temple. And so they, they, they make these accusations against Jesus, false accusations. Now, we probably all know what it feels like to be falsely accused. Um, kids, have you ever been falsely accused of something? Um, I, remember, I remember one time, me and my brother, uh, when, I don't know, we're probably like 11, 13 years old, somewhere around there. And uh, we were in the alley behind our house. And we were having we were having a contest. I mean, we were kind of uh, trash talking each other, saying, "See who could throw a rock the furthest." And we're like, "Oh yeah, I got." And so, so we were throwing these rocks to see who could throw a rock the furthest. And this this uh, guy just a few houses down, an older man comes out, and and he asks us what we're doing, and we tell him, "Oh, we're just we're just having this contest to see um, uh, how far we can how far we can throw these rocks." Well, the next day. We get word from, uh, from my, grand, my, my brother and I's grandparents that so-and-so told them that we were trying to bust out a street light. <laughs> we absolutely weren't, right? But this person goes and tells, I guess this, they knew who our grandparents were, and they go and tell, tell that we we're trying to bust out a street light. It doesn't feel good to be falsely accused. And so kids, I, I, I know it's, it's probably so frustrating. There's probably been times when uh, maybe your brother or sister did something and you got the blame for it. Um, and, of course, adults. And we can, whether it's back in our childhood or even as adults, right, there are times when 
uh, when we might be falsely accused, and even for something small, it's, it's an incredibly frustrating thing. Right? There's almost an, an irresistible impulse to defend yourself. Right? Like, you've got to stand up and say, no, that's not the case. Um, sometimes that might be appropriate. Although it's almost always better to let someone else defend you. Right? That can always come across better if someone else is able to defend you. But Jesus didn't defend himself. And he doesn't even let another defend him, right? So at least one example I can think of is, remember uh, when Jesus is arrested in the garden and Peter you know, cuts off a guy's ear um, and, and Jesus tells him to put his sword back. He, he, he heals this man and uh, allows himself to be taken away. Jesus didn't defend himself. He didn't let anyone else defend him. And not only did he bear these false legal accusations, but he did it all for a greater purpose. And that's so that he could bear something far weightier than these accusations that were thrown against him by the Jewish authorities or, or the Romans or whoever. He bore these legal accusations so that he could bear something much weightier, and that is the shame and blame of our sin. Right? I mean, it's one thing for Jesus to be falsely accused of saying, hey, you can't pay tribute to Caesar. That, that's frustrating enough. But in a sense, we can say Jesus was falsely accused of what you did last week. That, that, that sin that, that you're so ashamed of. And I'm not, I wasn't pointing at anybody specifically. <laughs> Just for a dramatic effect. Um, you can all think I'm pointing at you, right? Because it's true. It's true, right? We all have things that we're ashamed of. Sins that we have committed. And, and Jesus, in a sense, is falsely accused of those things. Right? Because he bore our sin. Right? He took on sin that was not his own. But he said, I, I'll take the blame. I'll take the shame. And so, so as, as, as frustrating as it must have been for Jesus to bear these false you know, legal accusations, he did it all so that he could bear our sin, which is so much worse. And so I think, I think it helps for us to think about times that maybe we've been falsely accused because that helps us maybe to appreciate what it was that Jesus went through, like how incredible it is that he took that blame for us. And so there's so much more here than the practical lesson of, of a quiet confidence. I mean, I'm sure we can, we can draw some more practical things from there. Like I said, you know, there's a time to boldly speak truth in the face of opposition like we see Jesus does with the high priest. And there's a time to have that quiet confidence and just to stand silent before your accuser. Um, that's great practical application, but more than that, I mean, we see some deep truths of the gospel here, right? That Jesus... Came to bore our, he came to bear our sin. He was not silent simply because he had nothing to prove, but it was so that he could bear our sins. So that like a sheep led to the slaughter, he could die for us. So earlier I quoted Isaiah 53, 7. Let me just read that to you um, in, uh, in, in greater context. Go ahead and, and turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles and put your finger there in Mark. Go back to Isaiah 53. I, I think that Isaiah 53 is one of the most incredible passages of Scripture because, of course, there's no question that it was written centuries before the time of Christ. And there's no question that Jesus was crucified and that... He fulfilled these things in striking ways. And so there's a lot of power to this. Isaiah 53, we'll back up to verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him 
the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked. Joseph of Arimathea. In his death, sorry, and with the, the rich man in his death would be Joseph of Arimathea. Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Um, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty incredible. The passage itself, the prophecy, yes, that's incredible. But really what's even more incredible is that Jesus did this for us. That the Lion of Judah, that the King of the Jews humbled himself in such a way. It really is true that Jesus is both a lion and a lamb. And, and, and you know, as we um, look at his earthly ministry, and even now as we consider him you know, reigning at the right hand of the Father, uh, and we, we, we see... Sometimes the, the lion attribute, sometimes the lamb attribute being expressed uh, more overtly, we might say. Uh, but he's both. He's both. And uh, that's, that's an incredible thing. As we come to a close, um, just consider how the fact that Jesus is both a lion and a lamb, how, how it threw so many people off. Right, so in retrospect, we can look back at Isaiah 53, and we can see, wow, how incredible this is. But, um, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. I, I think this is really important for us to get. Like, you know, as, as we look at the, at the Messianic prophecies throughout the Old Testament, you kind of see two streams of prophecy. We see these prophecies about this great and, and mighty king, right, who's going to come and, 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 uh, and redeem the people of Israel and set all things right, and, you know, the, the government shall be upon his shoulders and he shall reign forever. Um, but then we also see things like Isaiah 53, uh, this quote-unquote suffering servant. And I, I, think, I think in the people's minds, uh, in Jesus' time, it was just impossible for them to think, okay, how can both of these be true? And so sometimes we do this with Scripture, don't we? We're like, okay, I understand this. But I don't understand that. So we might just kind of sweep something aside and we cling to what we understand and what makes sense to us. Can't do that, right? We've we got to accept it all, even if there's a mystery to it. And so they, they could understand and they could appreciate this Messiah coming as this great and mighty king, but all this like suffering servant type stuff, well, I don't know what that means, but I'm going to push that aside. But because of that, they ended up missing Jesus entirely, or at least many of them did. And so... Um, we have to embrace it all, right? That Jesus is both a lion and a lamb. And, and really, in order to know Jesus as he is, in order to understand the gospel, we've got to understand both of those things. We have to embrace both of those things. Yes, he is the king of the Jews. And, and again, what, how, how does he answer that first question uh, to, to the high priest uh, when he's asked, are you the Christ? He says, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Yes and amen, that's true. But it's also true that like a lamb led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. So we need to understand that. And then finally, maybe if we could just close on a point of application for us. Like Jesus, we need to embrace the irony. There, there was some irony as Jesus stood there, condemned before Pilate, um, and yet King of the Jews. We understand, like as Christians, like like we um, we have this great inheritance in Christ, and, and in Christ He has given us all things. We are children of God, and we will one day reign with Him. And yet, and yet, we are called to humility and suffering. And many of the same ways that, that Jesus experienced, and to a lesser degree. Um, but it's kind of like, well, if, if we are to be raised with him, we must also die with him, Scripture says. 
or I think about the Beatitudes, right? This, this kind of gets to the whole irony of even our lives as Christians. And so I'll close with what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see the irony there? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Listen to this one. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. When you're falsely accused. Blessed are you, he says. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this incredible gospel. Thank you for Jesus, who is the Lion and the Lamb. Help us to fully embrace that. Um, help us to live that out in the ways that we're called to as followers of Christ. Um, we're thankful for the gospel. We're, thank we're thankful for, um, most of all, how Jesus has saved us for our sin from our sins, but also even the examples that we can see to follow. We're so thankful, Lord. And so we pray that you uh, just continue to guide us, give us wisdom by your spirit. In Jesus' name.